Hi, I'm Blake Odom with Alliance & Associates, where we're insuring your peace of mind each and every day. No matter what your insurance needs are, we've got you covered. And it's our honor to sponsor tonight's Challenger Special. ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo. We ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. Obviously a major malfunction. never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye, and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. We were able to determine exactly what happened. Uh, we know precisely how this accident occurred. stars in the sky were like the stars in his eyes, twinkling as he told me what it was like to fly in space. It's a great pleasure for us to be here. We expect weather like this on uh, Sunday when we launch, and you all do the best to keep it that way, if you would. Well, I am so excited to be here. I don't think any teacher has ever been more ready to have two lessons in my life. And you can like through now. Big smiles today. Well, NASA's space shuttle program actually uh, anticipated flying 60 flights every year when it first was conceived after the Apollo program was over, uh, which meant, you know, you can fly uh, one of these more than every week of the year. And because it was supposed to be so uh, reusable for many flights, they tried to recover as much of the hardware for reuse, which included the whole orbiter, obviously, and the only thing that was expended, really, was the ex big external tank. The solid rocket boosters were retrieved out of the ocean under parachutes and brought back to uh, refurbish and reload. And the problem they quickly ran into is they found uh, that it was far more difficult to refurbish all this hardware and get it back online. It became quite evident that that kind of a flight rate wasn't really possible at all. But that was the conception of the shuttle in the first place, was a real uh, freight train to space. I remember when the space shuttle program was announced, and I thought that's kind of neat, because I thought having a reusable vehicle would be the way to go. I realize now that that's 
probably a mistake. The shuttle was tremendously complicated. Riding on a rocket's not a real smart thing to do. The fact is it's, it's fraught with, with risk, and especially with a complicated vehicle like the shuttle. I remember on my first flight back in 1983, at two minutes, the solid rocket boosters have expended their fuel and they're jettisoned. But I remember distinctly thinking, ah, my chances of surviving just went way up. Because it's true, I, we all knew that solid rockets are more dangerous inherently than liquid fuel rockets. There were two major issues in the solid rocket boosters from returned hardware. One was the excessive erosion we'd seen in some of the nozzles and also some erosion on the O-rings, both in the field joints and in the uh, nozzle joint on the boosters. The O-rings had redundancy. There was a two O-rings in the system, one a primary and the other secondary. And that's one of the conditions you try to create for a manned spaceflight is have redundancy wherever you can. Unfortunately, in solid rocket boosters, there's very pl few places you can do that. Ellison Onizuka, who had flown the shuttle in January of 85, one year before Challenger. When we pulled those boosters back, we noticed on one joint on each booster, we had trapped soot between the two O-rings. Heavy, thick, black soot. The primary O-ring had some erosion. The secondary didn't have any, but it said the primary O-ring had lost its seal and we couldn't figure out why that occurred on that particular flight. We went back through all the records and the tolerances and all on the design and finally concluded that happened because of the cold temperature. At that time, that was the coldest launch uh, the shuttle had experienced, which is at about 53 degrees Fahrenheit. I was amazed that the astronauts, including Ellison himself and the others, weren't aware of these in-flight anomalies he was never told about the condition of the boosters in, in his case, and, and none of the astronauts were. My second flight was in April, I think it was April of 1985, and I was the flight engineer, which was my STS-51 flight. There were near failures in the nozzle, in the O-rings, in our flight, on our vehicle. So apparently, to my great surprise, we came close to being the Challenger accident. The big concern finally came about when we noticed in taking off the nozzle, which is the back end of the booster, that has also two O-rings, that the primary O-ring was totally eroded through in three different locations, and that created a real concern about the safety of flight from O-rings. And he got so exasperated, I think at one point he declared, he said, well, what do you want me to do, fire call, wait till spring? Well, he probably should have. 4.55 a.m., St. John's County, two tractors, 700 acres, 85 workers waiting. A local farmer growing potatoes for local families. That's why when Danny gets up, he turns on Channel 4. With an hour-by-hour -hour forecast, Richard Nunn tracks storms right to these fields keeping him ahead of bad weather all day long. On this farm, Danny makes delicious mashed potatoes happen. In Jacksonville, The Morning Show makes mornings happen. You've upgraded all your old technology. So what about this? It's time to get into the new with Ford. Now get a Ford Fusion, Escape, or Focus with 0% financing for 60 months plus $2,000 trade assist cash. New is Ford, America's best-selling brand. Get into a Focus, Fusion, or Escape with 0% financing for 60 months plus $2,000 trade assist cash. Only at your local Southern Ford dealer. Time is running out. Call Alliance & Associates today to find out if you qualify for ACA coverage before the January 31st deadline. Everyone will need to use the health care system at some point for routine care after an accident or to treat an illness. Don't be caught without health insurance. Costs are skyrocketing and having coverage is essential. Health insurance is now mandatory and you must be covered to avoid high tax penalties. The deadline is January 31st. Alliance & Associates offers plans starting at no charge. Call 904-552-1111. Ready? It's happening right now at Rooms to Go. 
Pick from 100 beautiful rooms, each under $1,000. Picture it, your home, fully furnished in your style. With living rooms under $1,000. Dining rooms under $1,000. Bedrooms under $1,000. 100 stylish options under $1,000. And it gets even better. Finance for $20 or less per month, interest-free. Furnish your home to perfection. Now at rooms to go uh, I'm one of the three people on board who's who's and it'll be be my first time to fly Krista McAuliffe and uh, Greg Jarvis will all, it'll also be their first time and we're just all looking forward to getting on urban and getting the uh, secret handshake. I'd like to... Uh... We loved every moment of that training period and opportunities to get to know each other. Oh, look at All the, the training that we did, uh, emergency training for the orbiter, very, very similar to the training that air crews do in the Navy and the Air Force and Marine Corps, training for water survival, training, training for, uh, uh, you know, survival out in the woods if you had to bail out or whatever. We had a mock-up in Houston where if the orbiter were to crash land or go off the runway and you had to get out somewhere, we practiced uh, water survival training uh, such that if we did have to bail out over the ocean, you know, we were able to get into our rafts and our suits and everything and be comfortable. Krista McAuliffe became a great friend of mine. We gathered frequently in my home there was a tremendous amount of attention. My goodness, she was representing every civilian in the world on this wonderful opportunity to fly in space. Um, and she was so precious, clever. Um, she became everyone's friend next door. That anticipation of coming to the Cape prior to a launch into space uh, this was, it was really neat. It was like, hey, this is really going to happen. Uh, this is it. And, and seeing the vehicle on a pad and knowing that you had that awesome team pulling this all together to, uh, to help, that was pretty cool. You know, the night before launch, it's, yeah, there's one, it's anticipation. It's, okay, I got to get some rest. I got a busy day tomorrow. You know, it's, it's special. It's, uh, and I know that's what they were thinking. They were, uh, they were looking forward with the great anticipation to the launch. And uh, then we have uh, Commander Dick Scobie uh, sitting beside uh, Pilot Mike Smith in front of the traditional cake featuring Halley's Comet and an uh, apple for the teacher. Judy Resnick... On well, on January uh, 27, we had attempted a launch and, and it got scrubbed. And I went over to my friend's house, uh, a fellow named Carver Kennedy. He was the uh, vice president of our space services. He did the actually stacking of the boosters and the tank and the vehicle assembly building. And I was there about an hour and I got a phone call from one of the people that worked for me. And they said, oh, you know, uh, we just heard that uh, some meteorologist in uh, Orlando was saying that these strong ground winds we saw, that right behind them is a cold front heading towards Florida. And it may be as cold as 18 degrees Fahrenheit by tomorrow morning at the opening of the launch window. I said, good grief, I'm, I'm really worried that our O-ring seals and these seal joints will operate properly, those kind of temperatures. And he says, yeah, we are too, and our engineers uh, wanted me to call you to see if you can get from NASA an actual hour-by-hour -hour forecast of the temperature at the launch site. I says, fine, I will get that for you. I want you to get all the engineers together to put together a presentation on what we know and don't know about the impact of these temperatures on this field joint. What is the lowest temperature it's safe to launch? And I want that done. I will set up a meeting with the NASA management here at the Cape. I will plug, have them plug in their engineering people at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville on this three-way teleconference with our engineers back in Utah. And I'll set that up for this evening the conference call started a little after 8 o'clock that evening, and uh, the engineers did exactly what I asked them to do and, and went through their charts. Roger Beaujolais was one of the major ones, Darney Thompson, and they presented all what they knew and didn't know. And when they got all done, the vice president of engineering came on. 
a fellow by the name of Mr. Bob Lund that I had requested, and he said based on what his engineers had presented, that he would not recommend launching below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, this was the first time that Morton Thiokol, first of all, ever made any recommendation not to launch. In fact, as far as I know, it's the first time any contractor in the whole shuttle program ever made a recommendation not to launch. I was shocked at the response from NASA. And what surprised me is they started questioning the basis for that recommendation and said that they didn't feel that we had substantiated uh, the need to placard the shuttle to that temperature limit. And furthermore, as far as they're concerned, they don't think the temperature has necessarily anything to do with it. And that's when Roger Beaujolais got very vocal about, as far as he was concerned, if you look at those, it's the influence of temperature. I was really surprised that Mr. Larry Malloy, who was the head of the solid rocket boosters, said, well then, back all, when the hell you want me to launch, next April? When he said that, I thought that was very intimidating to me and everyone else that it was clear they didn't accept what we had just said. And then he said, you know, the eve of a launch is a hell of a time to be changing the launch commit criteria. So then he asked uh, his, his engineering guy, George Hardy at Marshall, what his position was. And he basically said that he was appalled at the recommendation we made based on the information we had. But he wouldn't go against the contractor's uh, recommendation. After he had made that comment, Mr. Larry Malloy then asked my boss, the Vice President of Pace Booster Programs, Mr. Joe Kilminster, he said, Joe, what's your position? And his position was that uh, uh, I can't go against our engineering's recommendation, but that he thinks that uh, he would like to have some time to go off the net to make sure that we had presented everything we have to make sure that uh, we have no further information to, to make a judgment on. Because there was an implication that maybe we hadn't presented everything. And frankly, when that happened, I thought, sure, yeah, they're going to do the best they can and try to analyze uh, what is the lowest temperature we can. Maybe it's not 53, but it's clearly probably not going to be 20. Well, what I found out later, what happened back in the conference call, engineers got put into a position to prove that it would fail at the expected temperatures. Now that's a totally different question than prove that it's safe. They could not prove that it would fail. That's the first problem. But the major problem was that the general manager of Morton Thiokol, a fellow named Jerry Mason, who I didn't even know was in this meeting at all, got up and said, you know, uh, he thought NASA had some good points. And that uh, he said, you know, am I the only one here that thinks it's okay to go ahead with the launch, this plan? Well, that was an intimidating statement for, hi for him to make because everybody became silent when he made that statement. And that the only two people that weren't were the ones who were most knowledgeable in the first place, Roger Beaujolais and Arnie Thompson. Arnie Thompson went back there and said, hey, here's why we shouldn't change our recommendation. And Roger went back with the two photos and showed them between the cold and the hot. Here's, we're going in the direction of this one. It's gonna get worse. We don't know where the cliff is, but there's one out there someplace. And, and they said, well, that's no new information, you know, go sit down. At the Cape, I didn't realize that was happening. But when they did finally come back on, was my boss, Joe Kilminster came on and said they went, reassessed all the data and they have concluded that it's okay to proceed on with the launch as planned, no specific temperature. And I was kind of taken aback by that because I didn't hear him present anything that new information that would change the original recommendation, but that's what he said. And then George Hardy at Huntsville said, well, we need to have that recommendation put in writing and signed by a responsible Thiokol official. And I knew who that responsible Thiokol official was. That was me. That was my job. That's why I was at the Cape. I did the smartest thing I ever did in my lifetime. I refused to sign the recommendation. I just didn't feel comfortable with it. And because of that, my boss had to sign it. 
and fax it down to me. Well, I made uh, a couple of very prophetic statements that night when I was waiting for this fax to come that was signed by my boss authorizing to proceed with the launch. I was very upset, uh, and I told NASA that I don't know who made this recommendation. I really don't care if it's the CEO, but you can't accept it. So you can't accept it because you know, and I know, you're asking us to fly those solid rocket boosters outside of what they were qualified to fly in. That's a violation of protocol. You can't do that. I sure hope nothing happens tomorrow, but if it does, I'm not going to be the person to stand before a board of inquiry and tell them that I gave you my approval to launch my rocket boosters in an environment that they were never qualified to fly in. And that ended the conversation. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. When you've been injured in an accident, it's very important to call Harrow and Harrow early in the process. We will sit down and talk with you for free. Ultimately, our goal is to get you the justice that you deserve. Harrow and Harrow, don't settle for less than you deserve. With AT&T, the choice is yours. You only pay for the services you need to make your bundle work for you. Call now to get high-speed internet for just 15 a month for 12 months with a one-year term with TV, home phone, or even wireless on one AT&T bill. With UVerse high-speed internet, you get fast speed at an affordable price and a Wi-Fi gateway that connects all your devices so you can save on mobile data usage at home. Call now to get high-speed internet for just 15 a month for 12 months with a one-year term with TV, home phone, or even wireless. And for a limited time, switch to AT&T and get an extra $100 reward card. Don't wait. Call this number today. Get more choices to bundle and save because with AT&T, it's whatever works for you. That's Larry's Giant Subs apart from the other sub chains. Larry's is the only sub shop that uses all natural and antibiotic-free deli meats and cheeses on all of their subs and salads. People want to eat healthy, and healthy food that tastes great is why millions of people eat at Larry's Giant Subs. Fresh, healthy, delicious. You've got to love Larry's Giant Subs. Only the king of subs. The opportunity of a lifetime. The chance to be in space. Well, if not for the grace of God, maybe I would have been aboard that orbiter. Near miss. The decision that kept this local teacher off the Challenger and saved his life. Tonight on the 10 o'clock news. I think what most people didn't understand was that how big a plate NASA had at the time. Looking at it at a more macro scale, they had suffered the prior launch, had more uh, delays than any launch prior in history. The one that Bill Nel Congressman Bill Nelson was on, it had been delayed something like seven times. They got chastised by the press because the prior launch was delayed so many times. The Orlando Sentinel had an article there saying, you know, NASA uh, claims they're gonna be launching two of these a month in the next couple of years, and they couldn't even launch one in a month that was already ready to go, declared ready to go, which was true. So they had to prove that they were capable of doing that. It's, it's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I think a NASA's uh, association with the teacher in space on this launch and from the PR given to that astronaut, Krista McAuliffe, it played a role from two points. One is that it was the first ordinary citizen that created a, a group of people watching this uh, launch far greater than they'd seen in for a long time because it became quite routine. I don't think any teacher has ever been more ready 
to have two lessons in my life. I've been preparing these in September, and I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. I'd like to Her lesson plan was to provide a lesson to all these children in the schools on the fourth day of the mission. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 20th January was on Tuesday. Friday would have been the day that she would be giving this lesson plan to all these children in the schools. If it got delayed one more day, that would have pushed it to Saturday. How many kids are in school on Saturday? There they are, the crew of Mission 51L. The next uh, morning, when he called to say, uh, we're going to fly, and I said, oh, oh, really, last night you said you wouldn't be uh, flying because of the weather and so forth. And he said, well, they've decided we will. And I said, well, I, I told all our guests to go on home that you wouldn't be flying. He said, yes, and uh, I love you. This is shuttle uh, launch control at T-minus two minutes, 20, I mean two hours, 28 minutes and counting. Here comes the uh, 51L flight crew boarding the elevator uh, for this thing. Here comes the flight crew now. All of the Challenger 7 families were together at Kennedy Space Center. We were on the top of a building, administration building. The countdown was, a little, was tense, as, as it should be, and I was standing next to Steve McAuliffe, explaining to him because he was the, had the least amount of information about launch and, and what happens with a launch. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. We we watched it and and cheered. It was like we were all on top of the world after it launched. It was a beautiful, beautiful, cold winter morning. Um, the ground shook, the fire crackled. You know, it was tremendous. And and we were just all shouting, the top of the world. You know, can you imagine? Um, greatest joy for that our loved ones aboard the crew. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. And we were both angry. We were both angry to know that it could have been prevented. It was a sad day when we learned it could have been prevented. Crime alerts, scams, rip-offs. News 4 Jack's crime and safety analyst, Gil Smith, is here to help keep your family safe. He's always looking out for you. Gil Smith has helped me protect my children. A unique take on breaking news. He's getting in, he's rolling up his sleeve, and he's already assessed the situation. When crime hits close to home. He puts me at ease. Gil Smith's got my back. I would definitely say Gil has my back. I'm News for Jack's crime and safety analyst, Gil Smith. And I've got your back. Family Home Center of Lake City is your exclusive factory outlet center, and we commit to you the lowest prices on live oak homes. Homes starting only $29.9. Four bedroom special for only $49.9. And no home compares to live oak homes with two by six wall construction, stainless steel appliances, 84 inch ceramic shower, and much, much more. So remember, it's our guarantee to you that nobody will beat our live oak home prices only here at Family Home Center of Lake City. To some, this is just a file. To me, this is a story of a wife, two kids, a job and an injured father who can't work. There's a future in that file, and my job is to fight to help protect it. At Farah and Farah, we know the difference between a file and a human being. No matter who you are, I will fight for you and yours. I represent injured people and their families. Call me at 396-5555. Are you tired of driving all over town, getting the run around? Here at March Motors, we offer real buy here, pay here financing. Come see me, Peppermint Patty, bring me proof of income and a down payment, and we will finance you.
throttling up. Three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. Three engines now at 104%. Go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. And then I saw those uh, solid rocket boosters start veering off in their own no direction, time. kind of spiraling out of um, a trajectory that's, that was so uncommon. I, I was concerned about that, and uh, that's when um, one of the fellow astronauts said we should all go downstairs. We have no downlink. This is Mission Control Houston. We have no additional word at this time. Flight Fado. Go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. Fido, can we get any reports from recovery forces? Stand by. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water at a, a point approximately 28.64 uh, degrees north, uh, 80.28 uh, degrees west. We are awaiting uh, verification from uh, uh, as to the location of the recovery forces in the field to, to see what uh, may be possible at this point. Yes, sir. DOD LSO reports that all, all soft forces have been scrambled and they are on their way. Okay, all operators, watch your data carefully. Okay, everybody, stay off the telephones. Make sure you maintain all your data. Start pulling it together. When... Um they transported us from this administrative building over to the crew quarters where we had visited so many times. I saw on the street where people all were weeping. They were at their steering wheels weeping or uh, out with their head on the fender or on the people embracing on the street. Just cars stopped on the street. And I knew it was it was really really serious. And you know, you've gone from this most exciting moment in your life to this terror, uh, and with sheer raw you know numbness. It's um, shock. It it is totally shock. Late this afternoon, the space agency officially confirmed what had been frighteningly apparent from the beginning that no one had survived. Good evening. Shortly after the accident, NASA... At first, it was just, no, that didn't happen. When they came and told us, and, and of course, we stopped, and, it, well, the crew's okay. You know, we, we, it was very difficult to accept that we actually lost the vehicle and the crew. When the uh, shuttle was first launched, I breathed a great sigh of relief when I saw it clear the tower, and I was absolutely stunned like everybody else was when I saw this whole thing explode at 73 seconds. I couldn't believe that the only thing I could still see flying were the two solid rocket boosters. Everything else had totally disappeared in this big explosive cloud. And I could hear people behind me actually sobbing. And I kept looking at the screen and I had my headset on and all I could hear was RTLS, RTLS, RTLS. And it was means we turned a launch site, we turned a launch site uh, to the orbiter and obviously nothing came back. Uh, head of the mission management team said that they're freezing everything on the screen and for nobody to write down what's on that screen, whatever data, whatever's there. The doors were immediately locked. The phones were all disconnected. So nobody could make uh, any telephone calls and that all of the data was going to be basically treated as secret and that nobody was allowed to leave the complex to even go to the bathroom. My feeling at that time was that the only thing that didn't cause this accident was the solid rocket boosters. And it wasn't until I went to Marshall the next day that I found out differently. A large-scale search effort was initiated to recover the space shuttle debris. 
22 ships, six underwater search vessels, and 33 aircraft participated in the operation. The pieces recovered initially were those found floating on the surface. The submarine fleet was used to locate and inspect underwater debris. Objects identified as being important to the investigation were retrieved. 50% of the entire vehicle was recovered in the effort. Well, we were in port, in uh, Mayport. I was called to the bridge, and by the time I got to the bridge, I could see the contrails of the launch and the explosion. I knew immediately, yeah, it was a disaster. I, I didn't connect it to the Challenger at the time, but yeah, I knew immediately. My instinct told me that you, that's not something you survive from. Not long after that, we got a message ordering us to see and go out and commence recovery operations. Five, 10 miles off the coast is where the debris field was. Just started searching the uh, ocean for debris. I vividly remember one of the lookouts alerted to something on the horizon that was in the water. And I noticed a little bobbing object in the distance. And we altered course and went over to discover the personal effects case, and in it were Christine McAuliffe's personal effects notebooks and her cameras and a substantial a supply of spare film. What we say today is only an inadequate expression of what we carry in our hearts. Words pale in the shadow of grief. They seem insufficient even to measure the brave sacrifice of those you loved and we so admired. We can find consolation only in faith. For we know in our hearts that you who flew so high and so proud now make your home beyond the stars safe in God's promise of eternal life. Every family member I talk to asked specifically that we continue the program, that that is what their departed loved one would want above all else. We will not disappoint them. The next day when I went to Marshall, and they had all the data there, and I checked it all, and I didn't see anything new, Ironically, as I was walking out the door, Larry Malloy told me to get the hell back in there. That's why, he says, we got Jim Kingsbury at the Cape that's viewing some films, and he said he's looking some films, and he sees this fire coming out of the side of the solid rocket booster. And I turned to Larry and says, well, you just tell Jim Kingsbury, he doesn't know what the hell he's looking at. Because solid rockets don't go flying around with holes in the side of them. They blow up. He said, well, you better get back in here and talk to him. So I asked Jim, I said, are you sure this is coming out of the solid rocket booster and not the tank? He said, yeah, absolutely sure, it's coming out of the solid rocket booster. I said, uh, is it coming out of a joint? She says, well, it's down on the bottom end of this right booster. He said, I can't really tell exactly, but it's in the area where the solid rocket booster attaches to the tank. I said, well, uh, have you ever seen, looked at any of the film of the actual launch on the launch as it was lifting off because I don't know how we could possibly had a problem with a seal that waited till 73 seconds to cause this failure. And I said, well, go get the cameras closest to that. And he did. And that's when he told me he saw this puff of smoke coming out. And I said, I'll bet it's around six tenths of a second. He said, yeah, 0.638. And then I realized that the initial failure was exactly the concern that we had the night before. It just manifested itself in a final failure much different than we would have ever anticipated. Because what really happened was is that it leaked for the very reason we thought it might at six tenths of a second. But as that flame went 
and burned the primary and secondary seal that allowed the gas to get all the way out. And as it burned the O-ring, it hit this cold, solid metal, and it solidified right where it burned the O-ring and formed what I call an in-situ ceramic seal, sealed itself up. And there was no evidence of anything coming out of that joint after the first couple seconds at all until 73. At 59 seconds, which is what we call max Q on the vehicle, maximum dynamic pressure, when the combination of the velocity of the vehicle and the air density puts the highest aerodynamic loads on the system, starts vibrating. Well, it just so happened that day was the first time that the jet stream was right over the cape. That jet stream kept trying to push the vehicle sideways as it was going up into the air. And because it was trying to push it off its trajectory, the nozzles at the bottom of the booster would cant to get it back on trajectory. In the process of doing that, it flexes the vehicle. And that occurred right near max Q, broke loose this fragile ceramic seal that was formed by the aluminum oxide. So it started flowing out of that joint again at about 59 or 60 seconds. And 13 seconds later, it burned enough of the tank out that it caused the tank basically to collapse and it collapsed together in that big explosion. The solid rocket boosters then got ejected off and they kept on flying. The very last thing they heard on the net from the astronauts was from Michael Smith, the pilot said, uh-oh, just before the explosion. So he had obviously seen something scared him. They made it clear to the world that, you know, this horrible disaster uh, that occurred, the astronauts basically were almost killed instantaneously from the explosion. They didn't know till several weeks later when they recovered the crew cabin that that wasn't the case. The crew cabin at the bottom of the ocean uh, separated from the vehicle, which surprised everybody, intact. And what they found was that this crew cabin, when they were launched, was in a pressurized crew cabin, just like you get on an airliner but they have emergency oxygen available to them. They also have what they call peeps in there, personal egress air packs for each astronaut. And they're basically air that gives them two or three minutes of breathing time to get away. Well, they acknowledge that the pilot and the commander both had their peeps on, and they can't even be activated unless it's done by a crew member behind them. And they were some of it was spent. They also said that others were also in their peeps. They did not say that everyone was in it, but the sus my suspect, they probably all were. So they probably all died at water impact almost three minutes later, two and a half minutes or so. That is what really hard to, to take, is realizing they probably didn't die till they hit, hit the water. When I came home, she says, you, Al, you got, uh, I got a phone call here that you have to uh, leave tonight on the company jet and go to an emergency meeting of the Presidential Commission investigating the Challenger accident in Washington. This question earlier about, uh, I think he phrased it, a concern by Thakol on uh, low temperatures. And NASA made it very clear that they were going to handle the whole meeting, present everything, if they needed any help from anybody, they would specifically request it. I might mention one of the major concerns which has been voiced both this morning and this afternoon is the concern about low temperatures on January 28th, the day the Challenger was launched. There were icy conditions at the launch pad. However, NASA is insisting, as it has insisted before, that the cold temperatures in no way created a safety concern for the shuttle or for its astronauts aboard. When they came back, Dr. Sally Wright had a stack of these pink telephone slips in her hand. And she says, you know, before we get back to the presentation, I got a call from a, one of these, returned one of these calls to a reporter here in Washington that said they heard there was some rumor that one of the contractors was so concerned about the predicted cold temperatures, they may even recommend it not launching. Is that really true? 
I remember Larry Malloy's comment was, well, we had a lot of people who had some concerns about cold temperatures on batteries and this and that. And because of that, we had all our engineers on a teleconference with all of our engineers in Huntsville and the folks at, at, at down at the Cape and reviewed all that. And as a result of that, Thiokol told us to proceed on with the launch as planned. And they gave us a written document signed to that effect. Then went back to his charts. And I sat up there kind of scratching my head and thought, well, I guess that's true, but that's about as deceiving as anything I ever heard. And uh, he started to do more charts and I finally couldn't hold it anymore, so I raised my hand. And I was sitting up there in the dark and nobody paying attention, couldn't see, so I started walking down the steps. And interestingly enough, they were asking a question on the new charts they give Larry. And Larry turned to me and says, hey, Al McDonald has something to add here. I says, well, I'd like to forget what's projected on the wall here and go back to this question that Dr. Wright had asked about uh, whether it was true that a contractor may have recommended not launching. I said, uh, I think that this commission should know that Morton Thiokol was so concerned about the cold temperatures that we recommended not launching below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll never forget Chairman Rogers standing up and looking at me and Neil Armstrong and kind of screaming, so, well, who in the hell are you? He said, would you please come down here in front of this conference room and repeat what I think I heard? Because if this, if I heard what I think I heard, this will be in litigation for years to come. My life changed when he said that. Did you ever have an experience where all the engineers voted one way and management voted the other? <laughs> that wasn't the case here. Well, what was the case here? But my question is, did any of the engineers change their minds? And if so, which ones? Well, let's see. I, I would say then that uh, I'll have to look at the list here. Do you remember any other occasion when the contractor recommended against launch and they, that you persuaded them that they were wrong and changed, had them change their mind? Uh, no, sir. You'll remember that I did say at one point that we thought the decision-making process may be flawed. I believe I'm speaking for the whole commission when I say that we think it is flawed. This tragic accident was a result of the failure of that joint on the the right aft uh, booster rocket. You've taken so much evidence showing that people knew about the problem of the O-rings at Thiokol and elsewhere. Some of them literally in one document even cried out for help. You took testimony about the pre-launch activities and the teleconferences where Thiokol engineers recommended against launching. When you sift through everything, how did it come about that the people responsible decided to launch anyway? Well, we've attempted to set that forth in, in our report. I don't believe there's any easy answer to it. Uh, it's flawed. That, that I suppose no one will disagree with that. Well, it was, How did people it was, come to that point? It was a failure, and I think you have to sit down and read the report and, and draw your own conclusions. Nobody during Challenger or Columbia made decisions that they thought would cause harm to the crew or the vehicle. The decisions that those people made, they thought they were making a good decision. Kent Justice and Joy Purdy, only on the local station. Sir, can you step aside? Sir, come on, you know who I am. Progressive insurance. Uh, I save people an average of over $500 when they switch. Did you pack your own bags? Oh, right, the Name Your Price tool. It shows people policy options to help fit their budget. Crazy that a big shot like me would pack his own bags, right? <laughs> so, do I have the right to remain handsome? <laughs> Wait, uh-oh. If you've been injured in an automobile accident and have legal questions, visit ForThePeople.com to get answers to your questions. Morgan & Morgan, For The People. Ready? It's happening right now at Rooms To Go. Pick from 100 beautiful rooms, each under $1,000. Picture it, your home fully furnished in your style, with living rooms under $1,000.
Dining rooms under $1,000. Bedrooms under $1,000. 100 stylish options under $1,000. And it gets even better. Finance for $20 or less per month, interest-free. Furnish your home to perfection. Now at rooms to go You've upgraded all your old technology. So what about this? It's time to get into the new with Ford. New is EcoBoost technology. New is a foot-activated lift gate. New is tougher, stronger, and lighter. New is Ford, America's best-selling brand. Get into a new F-150 with EcoBoost with over $10,000 in total value. Only at your local Southern Ford dealer. The opportunity of a lifetime. The chance to be in space. If not for the grace of God, maybe I would have been aboard that orbiter. Near miss. The decision that kept this local teacher off the Challenger and saved his life. Tonight on the 10 o'clock news. When I went home, I got called in by the general manager the next Monday. He said, first thing in the morning, he said, Al, you're no longer the head of the uh, director of the Space Shuttle Solid Ragnarok Project. You're now head of scheduling. I said, scheduling? What the hell are we going to schedule? I'm not build anything. He said, well, that's your problem. Once I got removed from my job, I was told I could not participate in the failure team anymore. I couldn't have any contact with NASA anymore. And it just so happened that Two months later, in May of 1986, I was called back to Washington, D.C. General Don Katina, who was the head of the Air Force Space Command in Los Angeles. He also was a member of the Presidential Commission on the Challenger Accident. She said, you ought to be spending all of your time figuring out why the shuttle failed the way it did. I said, well, I'm not doing that. So I'm not, not doing that. He says, you're a member of the failure team, are you? I said, I was, but it got removed. He said, you got removed. When did that happen? I said, I think it was exactly one day after I testified before you people. He said, you're kidding me. I says, no, I'm not. He said, we'll fix that problem. He immediately went out in the hall and called Chairman William Rogers and told him what he had just heard. Chairman Rogers called all of the senior executives in my company back to a meeting a couple days later in Washington and wire brushed the hell out of them. The following Monday, I got called in by our new general manager. And he said, Al, you know, he says, uh, we've been uh, working with NASA on figuring out how to get the sh shuttle back to safe flight as soon as possible. And we decided to do that by having this super task force. And he said, you know, we'd like to offer you that job. Would you take it? I says, yeah, I'd take that job because I think I can help. Start, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff, liftoff. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. When I was at the first launch after Challenger, which was in September of 88, Discovery, first of all, I breathed a huge sigh of relief when we cleared the tower and I didn't see anything abnormal. But I really got nervous when they got to the point where they told them they were going to throttle down the engines, which they did, and then they said, go for throttle up. And I heard the commander respond back, just like Scobie did, Roger, because I quickly had a flashback of what happened to Challenger within a second of that time. We've had one of the most successful uh, space programs in the history of mankind, and it's tragic that we lost uh, seven souls, but um, I'm clear that the progress that we have made is on their shoulders, and I think we'll continue. I've lost friends, very good friends, in rockets, but on the other hand, I don't think that's a reason to stop pushing the limits, pushing the thresholds. I think the, uh, the biggest lesson that we learned 
uh, from Challenger, a couple of them. Uh, space exploration is challenging. It's hard. And uh, I think the, uh, the important lesson is, you know, creating an environment where everybody is heard, where you can voice your concerns without fear of retaliation. Well, when I uh, define accident, I, I, I put all those uh, terms that describe accidents, not foreseen, anticipated. Most accidents, you don't have that opportunity to make a decision to prevent it. In this case, there was an opportunity for a decision to prevent it. The Challenger accident was a accident but it was one for which there were some pointers there should have been more awareness challenger was a terrible accident that could have been prevented and we were both angry we were both angry to know that it could have been prevented and yet human failure we understand and they've long been forgiven for those frailties